up for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. Welcome to the show. Welcome listeners. Welcome thrifters, pickers, antiquers, and DIYers from all over the country. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast brought to you by ARC Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. ARC Thrift Stores is a Colorado thrift store chain, and if you're in Colorado or visiting us, please check out one of our 31 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Savick, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. We discovered that thrift customers are literally some of the most unique and gifted people out there, and we want to talk to every last one of them. So if you're a person who's part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We'd love to promote your businesses and your social channels and share your stories and advice with our listeners. You can find us on Instagram at ARC Thrift. Send us a DM and let's chat. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited. Today, we're going to be speaking to Jim White. I'm going to give you a little background on him and then welcome him to the show, but we can't wait. He is a Colorado legend and his bio really speaks for itself. For his entire career and even into his retirement, Jim White has worked with individuals and families from all walks of life, from preschool to the elderly with the Meals on Wheels program. Jim retired after 35 years of employment with the Volunteers of America program not long ago, where he served as the Director of Marketing and Community Affairs, but his commitment to giving back continues. Along the way, Jim has been rightly recognized for his good works. He's received honors former Denver mayor, Webb, served on Colorado's Martin Luther King Holiday Committee and was 5280's Magazine's Humanitarian of the Year in 2012. He currently volunteers with the Colorado Symphony, KUVO, 89.3 Jazz Radio, and of course, with ARC Thrift Stores, which we absolutely love. He's received numerous awards, but we like to mention him being named Denver 7's Everyday Hero for his work with his self-built program, Books in a Bite. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm humbled by that introduction. That's for sure. I love it. And I I have to start by giving a shout out to your daughter. So one of the ways that Jim is connected to ARC, and there's many ways, is that his daughter is of Get Thrifty Podcast fame. She's at This Kitsch Life on Instagram, Julie White. She does a ton with thrifted items. We like to call her the Pyrex Queen. Um, So Jim White is actually her dad. And so we love, you know, a family affair here on the Get Thrifty podcast. So thanks for joining us, Jim. Well, thank you. And and uh, I would be remiss to also my other daughter, Joanne, that lives in Massachusetts. Uh, we usually, she's a special ed teacher. And when she's back for the summer, we were in and out of your stores a <laughs> hundred times in the last three months. So they're both are hooked on this and they there's only one spot they'll go and it's one of your arc thrift stores and they know everything about them and they swear that each store has its own personality Mm -hmm. and or if they're looking for a particular item they know which store they would have their best chance of finding it so um i i I just really appreciate having this opportunity today. Well, we're excited to dive in with you. And I mean, I think that kicks us off with my first question. We always like to start with a little DNA. So tell us how you ended up in Colorado and connected to ARC Thrift Stores. Okay. I moved, I graduated from Purdue University with a teaching degree in 1973 and didn't really, I was living right there in Lafayette, Indiana, didn't teach. And uh, I thought, I'm just the allure of Colorado. I'd never had even been out here. But the idea of that, you know, John Denver was singing Rocky Mountain High. That's and right. He, he brought a whole lot of people my age out here in the early to mid 70s. And in 74, I moved out here <clears throat> to teach school. I found out that that really wasn't my cup of tea. I did not enjoy teaching after after having getting that degree. And I ended up working for um, a psychiatric hospital with adolescents. Uh, Colorado General at that time had their own adolescent ward. And I thought, well, this is much like teaching, but with just a classroom of 12 to 15. I did that for four years. And then you just run out of energy. It takes a lot of energy to work Mm -hmm. with teenagers, that's for sure. And I saw this uh, ad for a 
Meals on Wheels. And I thought, okay, I'll switch over to the elderly. That has to be a more appreciative plot. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> might actually say good morning to me and, you know, <laughs> just once uh, during the course of the day. And so I did switch over. And then, as you said, 35 years later, I'm still working for Volunteers of America. But during that time, uh, some you know, Volunteers of America is a national organization. And in some cities, they do have thrift stores. We don't, obviously. And, but we have a 90-bed shelter for battered women and their children, which would always have a, about 30 women and 60 children in there every night. And for women and their children who wanted to start a new life and move out of the shelter, they quite often if they were able to get the money together for first month, second month rent, and they had no furniture, no clothes, the kids were sleeping on the floor, no chest or drawers. And so I would, myself would run around in these VOA vans and people would, again, because of our name, some people would donate items mm -hmm. to us. And at that point, there was nothing going on down in lower downtown, so I was able to mooch uh, some warehouse space, <laughs> and I would I would haul this stuff in there, drop it off, and then when a lady was moving out, somebody from Brandon Center, that was the name of, of the shelter, would call and say, Jim, do you have any beds? Do you have any pots and pans? And so I'd go and look through what I had, and it just it just wasn't working. And I saw an article in Westward, one of the free magazines, still newspapers out here, uh, about the current, at that time, the director of ARC thrift stores. And I thought, that's the ticket. I've got to hook into a thrift store. They're in the business because it is a business either you get into or you get out of because real quick, you got all this stuff that you don't know what to what are do. you going to do with it <laughs> right you know they come out and tell you know you know i'm preaching to the choir why don't you come out and get this great chair well they don't tell you about the other 10 things that they've got sitting out there for you and you need to pick it all up but mm -hmm. regardless at that point the director of arc thrift said jim we will give you as many vouchers to our stores as you need and what a godsend that was to be able to go to a lady and say look Here's $100 worth of vouchers. Get your kids up off the floor. Get them into a bed. Here's, go get yourself a chest of drawers. Um, you know, it's it's on you now. All I ask back is for to see the receipt that you uh, did, in fact, go and, and do this. And it was just so wonderful mm -hmm. for all those years. And that was my beginning of what brought me to ARC thrift stores was this unlimited amount of vouchers. Well, I mean, you're kind of giving me chills right now because I feel like I mean, you've been doing this for so many years. You sort of started ARC on this relief path that we're now on and so dedicated to. I mean, really, it sounds to me like that was the first, you know, taste for us of working with other nonprofits and, you know, creating this relief program that's that's become become yeah, so important. It may have us. been because I know at that time all I had other than my hat in hand was <laughs> I said, I promise you, anybody that calls us and has a pickup, I will send them to Arc Thrift Store. Absolutely. And of course, you get that little bit of blowback. Well, I don't want my stuff being sold. And then when I would tell them about the arrangement we had with ARC and the vouchers, they would all just say, well, that's incredible. That Get, makes sense. Let yeah. Me, yeah. Let me, let me call ARC and that's where I'm going to give it to. So I fell in love with your organization that way, just by this generosity of uh, that you were willing to let our folks who were certainly less fortunate, that battered group of uh, victims of domestic violence go in and with some pride and in their own Dignity. time and in yep. their own way, get what they needed versus, well, here's some old mattress that Jim yeah. White had in a warehouse down on 23rd and Blake. You, I love that you mentioned that dignity factor, because I do think that that is so important when you're talking about, you know, all these tragedies go down, these disasters and people clean out their closets. That's not what people want. They really want the dignity of being able to buy um, on their own terms. And when you give them a voucher and say there's 31 stores in Colorado, uh, pick what's closest to you and most convenient and you can go shop. It's, it's a piece of, uh, dignity that is sometimes lost in all of that. So 
kudos. Absolutely. Love it. And I've always, I was always confident too, that when they walked into your stores, it was going to be a, a positive experience. Mm -hmm. They're so well lit. They're so well cleaned that, you know, you're not sending somebody into some dark, dank, you know, with everything, not, nothing's arranged and they're going to have to pick through. Oh no, it's, it's just like going to a regular department store, mm -hmm. uh, except that it's, it's recycled items. Well, let's talk about that. You know, you've seen uh, ARC thrift stores grow and thrift stores in general and this trend of thrifting grow. You've shared the love of secondhand with your daughters. Uh, what do you think's changed? What, what does it say about society that people care about thrift in a new way? Well, I think what happened is you guys were out on the cutting edge of recycling before anybody else. Nobody was even thinking about it. I shouldn't say nobody. Most of the general population wasn't on this green path that we we're all kind of Johnny come lately to. Arc was ahead of the curve on that with the, all of the recycling that you do. And now, as you said, it just makes sense. You know, why, what else are you going to do with some of this? So on that end of it, um, you know, as far as items coming in, it's, I'm sure you just have a plethora of, of donations because that's what, what everybody wants to do with their stuff. On the other end, um, I think that, again, this is just my impression. First of all, there's a, a financial aspect mm -hmm. that things are going to be cheaper. I mean, nothing does my heart better than when you guys have your big back to school sales. Mm -hmm. And I've been in there and I see a mother and two or three children hanging on the on the cart and that cart is to the top filled filled <laughs> i mean filled with you know whether there's 99 cents or whatever but i think what a wonderful gift you're giving for people to be able to come in get a whole bunch of clothing before school starts and um and so there was that end of it and then all of a sudden retro and vintage has become this thing yeah yes. and the stuff that was in my mom and dad's house when i was growing up all of a sudden is worth a whole lot of money and mm -hmm. is just great to look at not only um has it been recycled but there's a certain nostalgic you know i look at like something as simple as a, a wire thing that holds magazines okay no, I mean, not many people have magazines anymore and not many of them put them in there, but those kind of things we always had in our house. You know, yeah. there was always somewhere where you put your life magazine and your look magazine and your time magazine and boys life and all of them were in these things. And now where if I wanted to have something like that, you go to Arc Thrift. So there is a nostalgic, wonderful, warm feeling about you seeing things and you go, Oh man, I remember that. Or I haven't seen one of those in a thousand years. Yeah. Here it is right there. <laughs> right there at the thrift store. And I mean, let's shout out Julie White again too, because she's at that Denver antique mart and she literally has like original aluminum Christmas trees. So if you're on the hunt for those vintage Christmas items, hit up Julie at the Denver antique mart, check her out on Instagram at this kitsch life. You can get all the details about what she's selling. And I know she's getting into that season because those shiny brights are flying off the shelf at all the stores. I know <laughs> they it's are. <laughs> and the bubble lights, let's not forgive bubble oh. lights. We should have been condemned from day one. They get so hot. <laughs> so dangerous. <laughs> if you want to find a string of bubble lights, I'll tell you, you can find it at ARC and you're not going to find one anywhere else. They yeah. probably have been banned. Oh, absolutely. You better get on it. And if not, <laughs> Julie's got them at her booth if you want exactly. to buy some of them. Um, okay. So let's talk about the other nonprofits that you're involved with. It, well, before that, speaking of Christmas, I do want to talk about your annual performance in our stores, right? To tell people, talk about your 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 love of Christmas and, and okay. how you do it upright at ARC. Well, when in one of those first years, 1974 and 1975, one of the people that I uh, became friends with was very involved uh, with a Mennonite church. I remember that. And he was the first person who asked me would I play Santa Claus. And I'd never done it before. I didn't do it any time back in Indiana. And I started doing it. And it was just, it's just magic for me. I 
I'm not, you're not viewed as a human being at all. You're this other thing. And the look on those children's faces. And so for years, I would be the Santa for Volunteers of America. And we would never tell people when they signed up for their Christmas basket of food, this big basket of food that they get, that Santa would be there to talk to their children because you don't want to make any kind of a build up their expectations and then we would run out of toys or whatever but we seemed to never that never happened and I thought this is the right group of children that I want to talk to now again there's nothing wrong with being able to go to Cherry Creek Mall and have your picture taken and buy the photos and have your child with Santa if you can do that that's great but there's a whole lot of children who don't necessarily get to talk to Santa because of the way it's rigged up. So when I had the good fortune of being the thrift store Santa <laughs> for ARC, uh, it's just a wonderful experience. I go around after Thanksgiving and I'm in ARC stores. And again, I think what better group of children for me personally to talk to than ones who are with their mom and dad and they're Christmas shopping in a thrift store. And it just Perfect. makes sense. So they come up to me. They're so excited, so excited. And after we chat about, you know, things that Santa talks to children about, then I'm allowed to give them a voucher for your store. And I really could just as easily be handing them a gold brick because they get that excited that all of a sudden, They've got a $5 voucher for your store. And the minute we're done talking and I ask them, you know, to leave some milk and cookies out and we kind of wrap it up, off they go with this voucher. And numerous times they come back by, they show me what they picked. And then they, there's this moment of hesitation and they, you realize they've changed their mind. <laughs> back it goes, right? And sometimes two or three times they'll pick out something and they're just that excited because when they walked in that store, whether they knew Santa would be there or not, I don't know, but I'm sure they didn't know they were gonna get a free voucher mm -hmm. to shop in your store. And my goodness, between the games and the toys and the books and the things that are in every one of your stores, there's no shortage of great things that a child can find. So. It is, believe me, I'm the one that gets the biggest kick out of playing Santa in ARC thrift stores. And uh, when that day comes that Hallmark approaches me and they want to do a, one of their... <laughs> I'm going to be out of luck. <laughs> you're gonna, I'm going to be thrift store Santa where I match up an employee, you know, with like a country Western singer. And uh, as only Santa and as only could happen in a Hallmark movie, I will be ready. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, one of the things that I love about your portrayal of Santa too, is that, you know, with these mall Santas, you have like this very limited amount of time to sit on Santa's lap. But like you said, they can sit on your lap. They can chat with you. They can tell you their life story. You're not pushing them off quick and no, they can come no, back. We, I want them to talk. And I love when I get a brother, sister, and I tell them that, that you know, my elves have been reporting there's been a little bit too much fighting going on. And they they just rat each other out immediately. <laughs> you know, it's his fault. It's his fault. You know? it, it, and I, the, I assure them, you know what? There's plenty of time. You yep. can still get this together. And I don't make any pride. I just say, listen, you do the best you can. And I promise you, I will do the best I can for you. And that's how we leave it. So it's very rewarding for me. And I, again, the fact that, you know, we're not Macy's, we're not, you know, but it's an ARC thrift store and they get to sit and chat with Santa. Um, I'm very proud of having, you know, having been able to have that role for quite a few years now. I don't know how many years I've been doing it for ARC, but I sure love it. Well, no, does that, now that I have you on air with all these listeners, do I have your commitment for this year? Are we going to? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'd be heartbroken if something happened. I mean, it's been very difficult the last couple with of years. With COVID, yeah. Yeah. And because everybody really wants that picture. They want mm -hmm. the photo. So what we've tried to do is, I, you know, set up little chairs or a little area where they're still right there in front of Santa, but 
the idea of being you know right on Santa's lap we haven't been able to do because of, of COVID. But who knows what what it'll be like this December. But most importantly, you know, I'll be there and the children will be there, and you all do a wonderful job of letting your shoppers know where Santa's going to be. Mm-hmm. So that if if people want to put a little extra effort um, and and come to a store that maybe isn't their regular store, um, I can promise you that it, it'll be worth their while if if they have a child of that age. It's perfect. And let me tell you, the stores vie for it. They beg. I'm going to a manager's meeting next week. We're going to make the decision on where you're going, and <laughs> it's going to be a fight. I can hear it now. And the marketing department, you know, we already have your chair. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. Yeah, the throne, please, a throne. Throne, not a chair. Sorry. <laughs> so we'll make sure we get that all ready for you and sent to wherever you're going. But but we love you doing it. This is proof you have it on on tape here that you know we want you back for sure. So thanks for doing it, Jim. <laughs> well, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, let's talk about your other programs that you do. Um, you are very connected to the Food Bank of the Rockies. And in retirement, you have come up with this new program. Let's talk about Books in a Bite and how you you know, came up with this idea, where it stemmed from, and how it's grown over the years. Okay. I uh, At first, I re- when I retired, I thought, you know, you hear it quite often. I'm sure you hear it, Maggie. Oh, you have said you're so lucky to work in a nonprofit. You must just feel perfectly content at the end of the day Mm -hmm. and you take it for granted or you go well not today you know you have (laughs) yeah you but the i it really is true that you if if you've gone down this path or not you need a purpose Mm -hmm. you need some purpose in your life so that you can reach out and be part of something bigger than yourself so when i first retired i thought i'm just going to take it easy enjoy my retirement and i I really found myself missing that purpose. So as I said, not to Brown knows you, but my two <laughs> favorite organizations when I was working at VA, obviously was ARC with the vouchers and all that, that I've done with ARC. And then the Food Bank of the Rockies were always so generous with food and so helpful to me whether we were doing a food drive, whether we were doing Christmas baskets, whatever, I was always able to call over there to the director at that time. And it was like, what, what can you use? You know, and we'll, we'll have a truck there for you. So I thought, and I got to learn about programs in each of those, those nonprofits. And I love to read. Uh, I'm, I've always got a book um, and I'm reading even more now, of course, since I'm, I'm retired, but reading is a big part of my life and what I'm hoping will keep Alzheimer's and memory issues at bay for a little bit um, is my love uh, of reading. And so what I put together, I knew that you all get plenty of books donated uh, every month, right? Isn't it like 200,000 or 20,000 books? God, It's an amazing number. And again, to your credit, you put them out for sale. If they don't sell, you clean those shelves off. It isn't like everybody's going through the same books all the time. And they go to a warehouse and you recycle them based on weight. So that's on one part of this equation. The other part is Food Bank of the Rockies have a wonderful program called Totes of Hope. And what they do is they work at its peak. It was about 90 schools. Uh, since COVID, it, the numbers dropped and, and they're, they're slowly climbing back up to that. But they go in and they put together totes of food in a bag for Fridays for children that are on the free lunch program. Mm-hmm. And so, again, it's the perfect child to get a book to. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so the idea was I would go out to your warehouse and this is how it works. I go out to your warehouse once a week and you have these huge cardboard melons full to the top of books and magazines. And I call through there and it's not hard. And I find children's books that are in great shape. Mm-hmm. And I take them to the food bank of the Rockies 
And then when a school comes, an elementary school, most of them are elementary schools, just because when a, a student gets to middle school and high school, the idea of hauling food home, you know, there's so much peer pressure. Becomes it's a problem. A cool yeah. thing to do, right? Even though they may really need the food because in each one of those totes, not only are there all kinds of goodies for the student, there's also the fixings for one big family meal. Mm -hmm. But now they also have books. So they can, since they're putting it together out at the school, they can go, well, you know, right now, Maggie really likes dinosaurs. Uh, let's put this dinosaur book I in, love in it. her tote. I know. So out it goes. So from those humble beginnings, again, I had you at lunch. I had the people from the, uh, I can remember the lunch the, from the Food Bank of the Rockies. We went down to the Blake Street Tavern mm -hmm. and I convinced both of you that to let me give this a try and that I think it would work because you have uh, so many books and the Food Bank of the Rockies has the perfect distribution ability for low-income children mm -hmm. and you did and i started the program up in 2018 gosh has it been that long yeah yeah wow. i've been doing this for over four years on valentine's day so it's easy for me to remember and last week i hit 115,000. wow votes. oh my gosh so, i know and again you think well in the big picture that's when you consider the number of books donated, but again, I'm putting them in boxes from oranges and apples, you know, 50 at a time, 30 at a time, but 115,000 books. And it's incredible. I've been able to expand beyond just the food bank of the Rockies. There's another wonderful program called reading partners. And it's for children who are one or two grades behind where they need to be mm -hmm. uh, reading and um, they have a tutor that comes in, a volunteer tutor mm -hmm. once a week that works with them. And so, again, those reading partners now are able to send those children home with books of their own. It isn't like a library. It's like you keep this. This is your book. And then Head Start programs, I take it to those. Uh, those are low income preschool. And again, I don't have any trouble finding preschool books. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, there's everything. And then numerous, there's several Montessori schools that I supply with books also. And then during COVID, I went out to the food bank, had some huge drive-throughs, you know, like at, at the football stadium. And so I would package books but in a bag. And I always had in there that the New England Journal of Medicine and National Institute of Health made it very clear that books are not gonna be a, a real spot for transmitting COVID, that um, the virus, if it was on the book at all, it would be in a very small quantity and after 24 hours, uh, it would be dead. So those books have, have sat for longer than 24 hours, certainly just even at the warehouse. But I put that in each bag and I would have it marked by what I've considered the grade level. And then when people came through the parking lot, if they had children in the car or they, we just would ask, do you have children at home? Would you like some books? Mm -hmm. But again, during that early time, people didn't even want to take, you know how it was, you didn't oh, want to take scared. a bag of anything. Yeah. yeah. So during that time, I also started taking bestsellers, which there's never a shortage of out oh, there. Yeah. John Grisham's, Dave Baldacci, James <laughs> Patterson. Oh, Lord. So I would take those to those free little libraries. I, I have a map of where all those are. Where, like oh, little in neighborhoods. Yeah. That people have out in neighborhoods. Yeah. Oh, so I would supply those little libraries. And then I went through Volunteers of America. I know where a lot of senior housing is. Mm -hmm. So I would take the best sellers to the senior housing also, as well as Bibles. Um, there's a lot of Bibles that get donated. And um, in fact, one of the things I wish I would have done was to take pictures of some of the beautiful book covers that people have sewn. Oh, yeah. From communion. For Bibles. Yeah. Yes, for yeah. Kind yep. of doily, like, I don't know the exact word, but yeah. the things that people, that's the only book that ever gets 
any kind of a wrapping on it, I, I should say. And Some I should, it would decoration. Be an interesting little pictorial <laughs> of what I've seen over four years, uh, what people have done with their family Bible. But I, I take those now to the senior housing also. Okay. Although at that point in your life, <clears throat> I think if you've wanted a Bible, you've got a Bible. Uh, True more than likely but i also take them down to the denver rescue mission oh, and good. the voa mission for the for the homeless uh both bestsellers and bibles so i've kind of it's grown more than than just the low income children but certainly that's the bread and butter and part of the reason i looked at a couple stats that i just wanted to share with with the listeners today mm -hmm. and it said having books in the home is twice as important as the parents' education level. Wow. And I thought, man, what does that say about how important it is? And it says books contain many words that children are unlikely to encounter frequently spoken in language, and that children's books actually contain 50% more rare words than they'll ever hear on television. And this is frightening, or even in college students' conversations. Wow. <laughs> I thought, no surprise. I believe that. Yeah, <laughs> that I have no trouble with. But half of children from low income communities start first grade up to two years behind of their peers. Wow. So it's very important to get books into those homes. And that's, that's my mission, if you will. And the most important part of books and bites. But again, the most important part is that you all have been kind enough to let me go out there. And the people in the warehouse have, are just so wonderful to me out there, you know, help if I can't find enough books or whatever, they'll bring another pallet over and have me dive in there. Because again, these pallets are chest high. So I'm only getting about a foot deep, right? I mean, it's all the further down you can go. It's dangerous. Uh, you need to be careful. You can fall into one <laughs> well, of those I know. things. I've lost Fitbits down in there, I can tell you that. So uh, it, uh, it's just been a wonderful project for me and somebody that enjoys books. Uh, very educational and very rewarding to know that this book is going home uh, to a child that um, you know, you, you wish you could sit and read to them. Mm -hmm. I can't do that, but this is as close as I feel like I yeah. can. Yeah. Gosh, so, with some of these kids, this may be the first book they've ever received. Exactly. And there's no limit to them. You know, I, and one of the things I want to say to if any, if anybody's listening to those that are listening is if you are in a PTA or you're a part of a school or a church group or a senior center, any organization that needs books, please send me an email. Yeah. And it's white, the number four, Jim at yahoo.com. White and for Jim at yahoo.com. I'm, okay. I'm in Denver. You know, I have that, that's kind of the limit of it. But anywhere on the front range, or if you want to hear more about this program, how easy it is, but, you know, you're going to get X amount of dollars for recycling things by the pound which mm -hmm. is admirable what you all are doing with the books. But the idea that these books still have a lot of life, of life in them. Yeah. Exactly. And that's when I was fortunate enough, thanks to you, that Everyday Hero is when I hit 100,000 mm -hmm. books. And I thought that The Hungry Little Caterpillar should, <laughs> the perfect. should be the perfect book because it's about this transformation. Anybody who's read it from a caterpillar to a butterfly and really that's what literacy and that's what reading does for a young child. Uh, you've just opened up the doors and, and, you know, in, in today's world, um, children pretty much learn from a computer now. Mm -hmm. I mean, books are not something that every child has in their house. They, they've got a, you know, the, the computer that they've got at school, but the idea of, okay, I want to read a, a Hardy Boys or the box, you know, I, I, I see these kids, they want like Diary of a Wimpy Kid or Captain Underpants. They love that. I mean, it doesn't they matter it. what they read. Look at how many kids started reading because of Harry Potter, yeah. but regardless of what you think of sci-fi or, you know, that, that genre, goodness gracious. And that's the other thing when I say, if anybody needs books, if you want books based on science fiction or a bestseller or 
a particular ethnic group. Um, you know, there are there are bilingual books. There's, you know, uh, black history books. You just let me know and give me a couple of weeks time and I'll find them out there because they're out there. There's nothing. There's no book that's not out there. And I found one of my I'll never forget one of the first books I ever read about man's inhumanity to man was called Andersonville. And it was Andersonville, Georgia. It was during the Civil War as a prisoner of war camp for the North soldiers uh, that had been captured by the South. And they were just treated, as you can imagine, the South's losing. They don't care what they do with their prisoners. And the book just made such an impression on me that I found a copy wow. one day. And I started thumbing through it. And there was a postcard from a POW in the Philippines, World War II, back to his dad um, in Philadelphia. And I know, and I said, you know what? I'm going to make this my life's work. I'm going to find this family, somebody in this oh family. Oh my, Jim, like, you have never told me this story. I've loved would, this. would like to have this postcard. So I started with, <clears throat> there's a gentleman, Rick Crandall here in town, K-E-Z-W, and he's kind of the head of all things veterans. And he did a deep dive trying to find somebody in this family. We looked for two years. And then there is an organization in Washington, D.C. that it's full of nothing but letters oh, you wow. know, during World War II that didn't make it to somebody. And that's where the, the postcard finally ended up. I was unsuccessful in my hunt. But the chances of me picking out that one book. It's crazy. Among the... T really tens of thousands that I see every week were incredible, but it's just one of those, one of those moments. But anyway, I'm very proud of that program. And uh, mostly it keeps me off the streets and <laughs> makes me feel good about what I'm up to, but it couldn't do it without art. That's for sure. Well, we're grateful that you do it. And, and I love that it, you know, there is this Dolly Parton connection. Every time we talk about this program, I start thinking about, Dolly Parton. You think literally. about Dolly Parton all the time I anyway. Mean, but it really is this great connection. And with, yes. you know, this, the, like the, the, cut the caterpillar and in, into the butterfly, you know, Dolly uses this butterfly logo and she's so connected to literacy and you really are Denver's Dolly Parton. I I've, I've said it before and I'm just so grateful for your service that you do all of this. And, you know, yes, we do make some money off the recycle, but gosh, we'd love to see those books in the hands of kids, you know, and you're oh, I know. facilitating it. Children who aren't reading at grade level by the end of third grade, third grade's kind of the, the really most Pretty important sure. are, yeah, they're four times more likely to drop out of high school. Wow. So that's the area where I really try to, you know, spend a lot of my time that preschool to third grade mm -hmm. are where I really focus, uh, the books that we get. I mean, there's still, I always put some aside for middle schoolers, you know, there's all the, the vampire books and all that. I mean, it's just, you know, what do I say? It's just so, I don't even get me started. So um, yeah, it, it's been a wonderful uh, adventure for me. Well, I love it. We're grateful for your service to our community. It, it blows my mind. Grateful that you gave us a Julie White. Let, she just rocks our world with her knowledge of Pyrex. So thank you for that too. And, okay. and I have to ask, I like to ask everyone about their unicorn item. So anything you want to throw out there the next time you walk into an ARC thrift store that is right there waiting for you, Jim, what are you looking to find? I'm looking to find uh, for Halloween, okay, which I know October is your big month. Oh yeah. I've got a leisure suit, okay, that I've pieced together from ARC, but I still need the white belt and those white shoes. The loafers. The, yeah, the loafer. Yeah, the white and a little strap that used to go across them and one little buckle. When I get that, I'm ready. I've been working on the hustle, you know, <laughs> the dun, 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 do the hustle. I'm going to work that out. And my leisure suit, when those trick-or-treaters come, they're going to get a real treat. A real, a real eyeful. 
<laughs> I mean, you may have found the best leisure suit in the state of Colorado. So once we get a picture of that, we'll be sure and share it on our social media pages. Uh, yeah, use that for, for my picture. For there this you go. Interview, for you? your profile. Absolutely. We're just so grateful that you're doing your part and spreading the good word of thrift with all you meet and books in a bite and all these wonderful things. But as we like to end every single podcast, we always like to give a shout out to our girl, Miss Dolly Parton. So what would you like to say? Any story you'd like to tell? Some connection to Dolly Parton that you'd, you'd like to do above your connection with the literacy game? Well, I, you know, to tell you the truth, I was fortunate enough to be at a Dolly Parton uh, concert when you were there <laughs> and was able to catch Dolly's attention. And when she waved up at you, I... It was the look. Remember, I was trying to describe what it's like when the kids come up and see Santa Claus. Yes. Uh, it was that same exact look. And I just felt, OK, I can go home. And I've done the deed. And Maggie has gotten the wave and acknowledgement from Dolly Parton. But I mean, it was, was like you were. Lady. Well, you must have been spiritually connected to her to know she was going to be there at that point, Jim. Well, the, the stuff that she did with Linda, Linda Ronstadt and mm -hmm. Emmylou Harris, yeah, those three voices together, Angels. you talk about the hair standing up on the back of your neck, some of those those tunes were really my favorites of, of Dolly. Oh my gosh. I love this. Jim, you're an absolute delight. Share once again, your email address so people can reach out if they are looking for books or if they just want, you know, to reach out to literally the Dolly Parton of Denver, one Mr. Jim White. <laughs> that conjures up all kinds of images it's white and then the number four jim at yahoo.com amazing and if jim. i can just do one more shout out yes please the colorado symphony oh yes i, wanted, we forgot yes, about I symphony. just well you know you think about the wonderful work that art does you've you've hired almost 400 idd ambassadors and and you do it Unlike anybody else, if somebody needs it work, you hire them and then you work backwards. And it's like, well, can you work an hour a day? Can you sort hangers? Can you sort clothes? And you make a job for these lovely people, 400 ambassadors mm -hmm. um, working at the ARC thrift stores. The, I volunteer with the Colorado Symphony. And it wasn't until I'd done it for a couple of years that I realized that if I had a child or a brother or sister who had issues like some of your ambassadors, I would never ever be able to take them to a symphony No, because I would be afraid of them, you know, doing something, anything, yelling, shouting, getting up, something where it would just be, I'd be sitting on needles and pins for the entire symphony. So the symphony has come up with what they call sensory friendly concerts. Mm -hmm. The idea being that they put together a quartet and that a group like yours, and we were able to do this a few weeks ago, um, can come, enjoy classical music, enjoy the classics, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever, and not have to worry about any kind of an outburst mm -hmm. at all or if they want to stand up and dance, or if they want to talk through the whole thing. It doesn't matter. It's a, a sensory friendly concert and the lights go, don't go down, the lights stay up. And we did it for maybe what, 75, 80 ambassadors, yeah. IDD mm -hmm. people. And this quartet uh, led by Catherine Beeson uh, um, from the, the symphony, they let them conduct some of the music. They let, you know, they put the baton out there and showed them how, how the, 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 the director does. And it just was a, a very rewarding uh, event because those in attend, attendance realized they never had this opportunity yeah. before. Yeah. Never had it before. And Hopefully we can make that a regular thing because annual. Yes. It was special. Yeah. I mean, it was, you just had to pinch yourself to, and tell yourself what you were witnessing because it was quite unlike 
uh, any symphony I've ever been to, I can tell you that. Yep. And we've been doing ARC University for years now, close to 15, I think. And, you know, those are always, first of all, it's a loud room to begin with, but you could have heard a pin drop. They were just overtaken by the music. And that they was, were. That's, they finished that first song and that group went wild. Yes. I thought, my goodness gracious, they are enjoying this music as much as you or I would enjoy this music. Something it special. Just, it really was. And I've always, you know me, that I've always preached about the power of music. And it was so evident that day. And I think that's what made it special. But I just wanted to thank those people at the symphony that were involved because uh, it, it was unforgettable. Yep. And it's actually a really great plug for ARC University. If you're in the Denver area and you know anyone um, living with IDD in our community that wants to get involved, ARC University is a great opportunity for social events. And like you said, 400 ambassadors, people with IDD working in our stores, that's 20% of our working population. And we're pretty proud of that stat. We are one of Colorado's largest employers of people with IDD. So we're Excited that you care enough to bring the symphony to us, Jim. That's pretty special. So thank well, you. Well, it that. wasn't special, and I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't blow the Kleenex over a <laughs> comb myself. But I play an important role, which is the audience, right? If you yes. don't have an audience, you, you don't have an event. So it was, it was a great day. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. It's amazing. Anything well, else you want to you, yeah. share? All this that I'm up to, and and. Thank you for uh, the role you've let me play with with ARC. I'm very proud to be a volunteer with you folks. That's well, for we're, sure. we're grateful. I hope it continues. And you heard it here first. Jim will be Santa. <laughs> Can't back out at this point. You've got to get your elf in gear, get ready, and let's make it happen, okay? Oh, well, I promise you I'll be there. Perfect. Jim, you're a delight. You've told listeners how they can find you white for Jim at yahoo.com. And listeners, thanks so much for tuning in today to the Get Thrifty podcast. Quick reminder, please save our pod and leave us a five-star review about how funny, creative, and smart we are. And if you're part of this unique thrift culture and you'd like to be on this podcast, we'd love to have you. Shoot me an email, maggie at arcthrift.com, or reach out via Instagram at arcthrift. And if you want to see some hilarious video of Jim as Santa on TikTok, you can find us at Arc Thrift <laughs> Stores. <laughs> Thanks so much and have a wonderful week. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. This podcast was powered by ARC Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.